Next, the House Rules Committee meeting on the crime bill. Late last week, House and Senate conferees finished work on the conference report to the crime bill. The Rules Committee is meeting to set up the procedures by which the bill will be considered in the House. Uh, the rules committee will now come to order. The, the first matter on the docket will be uh, HR 3355, the Committee on Judiciary uh, Conference Report on the Violent Crimes Control and Law Enforcement Act. There's been a request for filming of portions of today's proceedings as well as for taking of still photographs. Do you have any problem with that, Jack? <laughs> okay. Any objection? Okay. No objection. That's your good side? <laughs> I, I think you walked in I think you walked in backwards. Uh, would you like to be joined with anybody, Mr. Chairman? Uh, I've invited all the subcommittee chairmen to be with me. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. I'm not, I'll not take a lot of time. Mr. Chairman, I know what the Rules Committee is supposed to do. Um, and it's always a pleasure to appear before this distinguished committee. The conferees have concluded their challenging and difficult work on H.R. 3355, the Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act. As you know, the conferees on the crime bill were dealing with an extremely complex, comprehensive piece of legislation that addresses both the punishment and the prevention sides of crime, which the American public continues <coughs> to identify as its top priority. In putting together this massive anti-crime bill, I believe that there are some areas where the conferees may have slightly exceeded the scope of the conference or where the House conferees may have agreed to matters which might be deemed to be non-germane Senate amendments. Given the extraordinary effort to reach agreement on this omnibus bill, I'd be remiss in not seeking to protect the conference report from a point of order on a minor technical issue which would bring down this historic legislative achievement. So the general outline of the conference report is included uh, in the summary sheet attached to my statement, briefly, the conference report balances <coughs> hard-nosed law enforcement with a forward-looking prevention. It provides money for 100,000 new cops on the beat. <coughs> Prison construction in the states, we help on the construction. It reimburses effective states for the cost of incarcerating illegal aliens. It creates a series of innovative prevention programs aimed at giving this and the next generation of youth the choice to lead productive lives rather than going down the wrong road of violence and destruction. Financing for this $30.2 billion uh, program is provided by a trust fund which contains mechanisms to ensure that the anti-crime programs authorized within the bill will indeed receive those amounts. And I therefore appear today to request the committee to grant an appropriate rule so that we may consider the conference report forthwith. You have attached to it uh, the outline of the major conference highlights in a two-page statement, two-page listing, and we have uh, uh, <clears throat> then the uh, index of the crime bill itself attached to that, which is, of course, much more, com more complex. I would uh, <coughs> yield back the balance of my time, and if there are any questions, I would try and answer them. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for doing such a thorough job on a very, very difficult proposition, and I know that this legislation has been fraught with all kinds of uh, amendments and dangers uh, as it has gone through the legislative process. 
And uh, this is a much needed uh, piece of legislation. Some people may ask why we're rushing it through, but of course I know we've got two weeks left. You've got to go back and handle some malpractice. Rushing? Rushing, yeah. You know, we passed the basic bill in 1991. I know. And it passed the House, and it passed the Senate, and then it went to conference, and then the conference passed the House after four days of the conference, it passed the House in four days. It went to the Senate, and it languished there for 11 months. They never did take up the conference report again. No, I understand, and I understand. We just waited 35 days on this one yeah. for various components of the Democratic Party to, uh, and some Republican too, to uh, resolve, uh, try and resolve some issues in it. No. The bill has some things in it that uh, you don't want, that maybe I don't want, that we don't care for. Uh, I'll give you the example candidly. The uh, gun control ban. I'm dead set against it. You're dead set for it. It's in the bill. Um, I think that I should not be a sorehead and that uh, while I am, uh, <laughs> I think that uh, I'm going to vote for the rule and I'm going to vote for the bill. Uh, I think the bill, the significance of the bill and its importance to the American people overrides any one critical issue like that. That while I might not like it, I mean, it's not, it's not nearly so important as a whole crime bill and its effect on, on the nation, its potential effect. I find that the crime uh, situation back in my district just the, it rates number one in the polls. I mean, that's talking about the Brady Bill, it's talking about crime. People love to see that there's going to be 100,000 new police officers on the street. Uh, the, the educational programs that are going to go through for the young people and the community support. And, and these are very, very uh, fundamental uh, things that people just really want. They want to be uh, safe in their home, and I think that this will help doing that. Although it just deals with federal crimes, it will still put some kind of a, a model out there which can be uh, handled and followed up by the local police. So I, I, I really like the way you, you put the bill together and I hope that uh, we just don't have any delays in getting it down on the floor and pass through. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Solomon. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, go to Mr. Derek, oh, I'd be glad to yield my Mr. friend. Derek. I'm throwing a going away party for us. <laughs> what was that? There? He's throwing away, throwing away party for him. Oh, yeah, yeah. He wants us to throw it very soon, too. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much uh, for, the, for, your, for your hard work and on this bill. And, you know, the two uh, issues I think that come down that are causing us the most trouble on the floor are the uh, racial justice issue and also the uh, assault weapons issue. And, uh, you know, it's my hope that, that, that we can put those issues aside in the sense and look at the overall bill because you, you, you've really done a, a, a great job in, as, as far as you police the prisons, the prevention programs and, and the other uh, uh, violence uh, against women and drugs and so forth. And I hope we can put that uh, aside. You know, my part of the country is not unlike the rest of this country and the crime is the number one uh, uh, thing on their mind. You know, we are, uh, you and I, uh, disagree on the uh, on the uh, assault weapons uh, ban. I, I I can't understand how we can call ourselves civilized people and and not uh, uh, ban these the, these things. We disagree on that, but we we agree on the racial justice uh, 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 provisions and the death death penalty. But you know we we have we have become no longer a free nation. You know if our citizens can't pull up to a stoplight and they are nervous about looking to their left or their right for fear that uh, someone's going to whip out a, a pistol or something like that and, and blow them away and, and we can't uh, use our streets uh, in, in, in the daytime or the nighttime without fear. Uh, we, we are no longer a free people. We are imprisoned in our own country and we, 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 we must uh, 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 do something about this situation. You know, I want some, excuse me for going on, but, you know, I, 
I think the situation is, is going to get, you know, someone once said that the three greatest uh, uh, changes in, in, in history were the advent of agriculture, the uh, advent of, of gunpowder that ended the, the Middle Ages, and, and the third was the advent of the computer tra chip. And, and, as, and, and we're just kind of on a, on a bottom of a pyramid on that. And as, as we see weapons become more and more available, less expensive, more sophisticated, it's going to be easier and easier for small groups to project a, a greater power. And I think if we don't take this uh, under control now and, and try to do something about it, we're going to find that we're going to have a situation in our country one of these days that is similar to uh, Somalia, uh, uh, similar to, to other hot spots around the world where we have no control. Government, I mean, there are large parts of this nation that, as you well know today, that government cannot protect its citizens. Because it's uh, because of the crime. But having said all that, I, I want to thank you very much, and I want to ask you one question: Are you satisfied with the financing provisions in this? That this this money is is real, and this is not some sort of mandate that we're going to hand down to the states? I believe that it is. I believe that the 30.2 billion dollars in the trust fund, anticipated anticipated over a six-year period, will yield the funds that they have allocated about five billion a year. That's what we have authorized and appropriated in effect. That's what we're counting on. Those are uh, from uh, attrition within the uh, workforce in the federal government anticipated by the uh, GPO and by the uh, uh, Panetta's group and various other analysts. And they anticipate that that is what the way the in income will come in. It will go into that trust fund. It will be spent for these purposes. It is earmarked in that fashion, and I believe it will remain there. Now, some and of should. Now, some some of some of it has yet to be authorized, though, under the authorization process, or is all of it in the trust fund? I think all of it is authorized within the trust fund. All of the trust fund money is authorized in this bill and appropriated for in this bill. Thank you very much. Mr. Solomon. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, let me first of all uh, commend our good friend Jack Brooks, the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, because uh, he has a very, very difficult uh, assignment uh, in, that, in that committee, and we all recognize... 27 hours in two days input. and two nights. I can imagine, Jack. Believe me. Uh, Jack, you, you mentioned at the beginning a uh, massive crime bill, and... Uh, it certainly is that. Um, I've got some major concerns about, about taking this bill to the floor uh, in the immediate future. Uh, as you know, uh, we still don't have the, uh, the uh, I, I guess your committee has not filed the conference report yet. I know you've made some papers available uh, to both the majority and minority staff but I understand that those are not the complete papers. We have proofed all of the bill. It was about a 900-page bill. We've mm -hmm. proofed all of it since mm -hmm. we completed that oh. conference. That's been a mm -hmm. horrendous weekend for the staff, seriously. I can imagine. And they now have given it to the Legislative Council, and they are now printing it. But you have to check as they print it to see that the changes you agreed on and the corrections are actually implemented in that. Mm -hmm. When do you think all that will be done? We anticipate, we had anticipated doing that by 3 o'clock when this meeting was originally scheduled. We are now trying to uh, cut that back and have it available by 1.30. Hmm. And then uh, when do you think you might uh, take this to the floor? Well, you know, I'm just one of the wheels. The rest of them roll over in this outfit. And the leadership will decide when they're going to go to the floor. All I want to do is get a rule today so they have the option of going to the floor tomorrow or Thursday, whenever they can. I'm prepared to go to the floor tomorrow morning. Well, I, I just hope you don't do that. Um, again, um, I, the rank and file members really need to know what, what is in this bill. Uh, as I look at uh, just some of the summary sheets I've just been given in the last 10 minutes, you know, it is a $30 billion uh, grab bag for whatever is in there. And uh, certainly uh, I support very strongly crime control enforcement provisions in the bill. 
but I, uh, I strongly uh, oppose uh, uh, all of these uh, so-called social programs that have been added in here. And uh, they seem to be just uh, uh, an overwhelming number of them at, at uh, funding levels that just absolutely uh, amaze me. And I'm not, I wouldn't go through all these things, but it, uh, residential drug abuse treatment for state prisoners, $300 million, and drug treatment in federal prisons, uh, another $125 million. Let me explain and, them. Those are really both excellent programs, and you should support them. This well, summer. what they are doing is trying to encourage, help finance the states and the federal government in treating prisoners. They have a five year sentence. The last six months, the last nine months, they put them on a drug treatment program so that when they get out, they will not be back in the market for drugs. Hopefully you can change them, upgrade their uh, living standard, hope you can get them adapted where they can fight drug addiction when they get out. And that's what that is for. I think it's critical. I think we have found that the utilization of tax monies in prevention is the most effective use of our tax monies. We have spent a hundred years in this country throwing everybody in jail we could catch and convict, indict them, convict them, throw them in the can. And they get out and do the same thing. Now this is the first time we've tried a really innovative program that has money to help prevent people from getting in this rut, from staying in it. We don't want, we've got first and second generation criminal. We don't want third and fourth generation criminal. We're trying to break that cycle. It's critical. It may not work. I don't guarantee it, but it is a change from what we've been doing. And by God, what we've been doing hadn't worked very well. And this allocates some resources to do that. Make that effort to change it. I think it's critical. I have little children just like you. I want them to have a better life. I want them, I want to try this and see if it'll improve. Well, Jack, we don't, uh, we don't have time to debate yeah. the bill here, but... Hold on, uh, I wouldn't do you, that. You know, we, we could argue that uh, that's the wrong way to be going. What we need, we need more discipline in the homes. We need more discipline in the schools. Uh, we yeah. need random drug testing, and we could get into all this. Nothing in this bill deals with random drug testing, which is going to identify these people and make them clean their noses and stop puffing on the weeds and uh, inhaling the cocaine. Nothing here. You're not really, talking about cigars. Uh, no, I'm not talking about cigars. But uh, again, you know, I just uh, have a GAO report that shows we, we have seven federal departments with 266 programs already in existence, like, like, like what we're putting in here. We have uh, uh, 154 of these retraining programs at $24 billion that are in the works now. And my point is that I, I, I am just concerned that we're creating another CETA program disaster. I can recall when CETA first went into effect, uh, I was a town mayor, uh, town supervisor, uh, way back in the 60s. And when that program came in and they offered it to us on the county level, and uh, I said, this thing is going to be a disaster. Well, you know what? That turned out to be the biggest absolute disaster in the world. And this, to me, we're creating another uh, CETA program five times bigger. But be that as it may, my, my, I, I, what I want to just uh, uh, get you to do is to hold off on the bill because we, we don't have the final report. Uh, we need to have the members know what's in it, and we ought to be taking this up next week, Tuesday or whatever. You know, you said we're not rushing to uh, uh, adjournment here. We just put out two bills on the Potawatomi Indians and something else tomorrow to give us some fill time because we don't really have that much to do. Now, between Mr. Trump, you yep. are for the 60 death penalties. Excuse me? 60 new death penalties. Oh, I'm for it, but they aren't and the kinds of... you the three I, strikes, you're out. That, if you if you keep my drug uh, prevention in there, and uh, which I don't even sure you did yet, because I had a situation that said if you were convicted of of a drug felony, that uh, that counted one of the three strikes. I haven't been able to find that out yet. What's in there? And other members are just like me. But let me just again let me commend you for the good job that you do. Uh, we just want to know what's in the bill, and more than that, American people ought to really know what's in this bill before we vote on it. So keep that in mind and keep doing the good job you do. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, some of the new programs that you've uh, 
constructed, Mr. Chairman, uh, haven't been uh, used before the uh, prevention programs, the safe school program, the anti-gang initiatives, job training, anti-drug programs, boot camps, and uh, these are all geared towards the young offenders. That's correct. Right. And we think there are a large number of first-time offenders that ought to be handled in a different way from hardened criminals or uh, perpetrators of violent crime. Mm -hmm. First-time offenders, non-violent crime, maybe a boot camp, military-style boot camp is very effective to handle. We have one in the federal government now, but it's about a nine-month program, pretty extensive program of volunteers, and it has worked very well, but it's an extensive, a rather expensive program itself. And uh, we would envision a more mandatory uh, first-time offender operation. Uh, in my home county, we have a boot camp for about uh, 40, about 40. And they live in tents, and they keep their cots squared away, uh, they learn to do some woodworking, they learn to do uh, close order drill, they learn uh, uh, several things about discipline and about shaping up. They also have some time off to wave it to women inmates. Oh. And uh, uh, it has worked very well. It's just a, a small, small flea on the dog, but it does seem to work and I would like to encourage states to do that. I'd like to encourage other counties to do that. I think that the boot camps are good. Uh, it gives you a certain uh, yeah. a confidence to shape up and tend to your business. I went through boot camp, and you did, and it didn't hurt you any. I think it might have helped you some. <laughs> so, where'd you go to boot camp? Paris Island? Or? Paris Island. You want to go back again? You look, two of us could use that, I think. Yeah, we could probably use it, but... Uh, <laughs> I don't think you'd get over the first hurdle, Jack. <laughs> I don't know. It might fool you. When I was a kid, I, I was in the Davisville boot camp, and I used to go over there in my lunch hour. Now I think it'd take an hour just to walk over there. <laughs> yeah, I understand. Well, <laughs> time t affects all That's of us. Back when you were at Stevedore? Yeah. Well, you were in pretty good shape then, Joe. Oh, very good shape. <laughs> I wish I could revisit those days. Are you finished, Joe? Yes, I'm going to go back. Mr. Bailen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I just want to add, Mr. Brooks, I just want to add my, my words of commendation to those who already have already been given by our chairman and by Mr. Derrick for the very good work which you and your, your colleagues have done, this enormously difficult and large and complex uh, bill. In, in my opinion, and I'm sure in yours too, because we've passed omnibus crime bills before uh, over the past uh, several years, this really is, I think, in, in, in virtually every respect, the best and the most effective anti-crime legislation that Congress will have ever passed. Uh, obviously, it's imperfect. Uh, obviously, there are is, there is some uh, problems with it that's bound to be true with any really large piece of legislation, and hopefully we'll make some corrections as time goes along when we find out what works and what doesn't work. But I, did, I do think that, that you and your colleagues from both sides of the aisle ought to be commended highly for your very good and what I think very successful efforts to deal with this very difficult problem. Th theoretically, it's troubling to a certain extent, I guess, to, to all of us, uh, the, the major part that the federal government, I suppose, is, is assuming with this bill, and perhaps because of it in the future, in terms of uh, financing the war against uh, crime. But on the other hand, as a couple of our colleagues already have pointed out, that is the number one issue which confronts the people of this country. Uh, the local and the state governments don't, don't have the resources to deal with it adequately at this, at this point, at least, and I think it makes all the sense in the world for us to help finance uh, additional personnel, get police on the street, and additional prisons. Uh, it's, not, it's not the total answer to crime, but we have no, you know, we have no alternative. If people commit violent crimes, they've got to be put away. There's just uh, no choice we have. But at the same time, uh, I feel strongly favorably toward uh, some of those prevention programs which you and our friend Mr. Solomon have just been talking about. It doesn't make any sense at all simply to put more police on the streets and, and, and uh, construct more prisons if you don't start looking at the other end of the of the beginning of the funnel and trying to deter or 
direct youngsters away from crime in the first place. So obviously not all of those programs will work, will work perfectly, but a lot of them we've had a decent amount of experience with and do in fact work, and I think they will, they will be very, very uh, worth, uh, worthwhile. I just wanted to say one more thing, if I might, and that is to, to, to thank you, not even so much to thank you, but to commend you for, for succeeding in, in your very good efforts to ensure that the amendment which Mr. Berman and I first offered on our side was not in the Senate bill to help reimburse the states uh, uh, for the cost of incarcerating people who are in the country illegally who have been convicted of, of crimes. It vastly affects, of course, Texas, your state, and Florida and California, our state. Uh, somewhere between 10 and 15 percent of all incarcerated felons in our states now are people who are in the country illegally in the first place, and it, there's just no way in the world that the local and state taxpayers can be expected or ought to be expected uh, to assume the full burden and responsibility of, uh, of paying for that. It's a lot of money. It's only the federal government, as you, of course, Mr. Chairman, don't need to be told, which has the, the jurisdiction and the ability and the authority in the first place to try to ensure that people don't cross our borders, do not cross our borders uh, illegally. That's nothing that the states themselves can, uh, can take care of. And so I, I just wanted to commend you for the large amount of money, but the very reasonable amount, uh, which you've put into here, $1.8 billion over, over a six-year period to, to help the states uh, uh, with these costs. It's something which we appreciate very much, which I think is absolutely the correct thing to do. And, and further and lastly, uh, just again reflecting on that, to a certain extent, what I like about that provision of, of committing the federal government, as it were, to almost $2 billion for reimbursement is that it will also make us here at the federal level uh, more responsible and more concerned about what else we ought to do to prevent people from coming into the country illegally in the first place. If we're now as having to assume some of the financial responsibility, then maybe we'll start looking around to put some money up front in the Border Patrol, in a counterfeit-proof Social Security card, whatever else it is that we have to do to, to deter people from coming across or prevent people from coming across illegally in the first place, because we now know for the first time the federal government has to assume directly because of your bill, sir, some of the, some of the actual fiscal responsibility uh, for our failure to deal with that problem. So this bill you. also provides a billion dollars for additional Border Patrol yes. in an effort to prevent Illegal. It's going to save a lot of money in the long run, as you know, as well as, as uh, solving a lot of problems which, uh, yeah. which confront all of our states at the moment. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mr. Cullen of Tennessee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, I'm honored to be here with my friends from Texas, Jack Brooks. We have something in common. We have something in common, Mr. Brooks. Our heads have grown up through our hair. But we're still making progress, and that's a sign of intelligence. Agreed? <laughs> I hope so. You have really done a tremendous job in bringing this crime measure before us today. And I can tell by listening to you that you swallowed a lot to embrace the ban on the assault weapon. I don't support that measure at all, and I'm looking to voting against the rule and against the measure for that reason. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, Jimmy. A man of your judgment, sagacity, would consider turning down the best crime bill we've worked out in years because we're mad about guns or something? Yeah. That's not, not only that, but he's influencing me. Well, easy to I don't think you need much influence. <laughs> hey. I go say, uh, with an easy go. Jack, keep talking. You're just paying me a big compliment there. And I, I hope people back home are listening. I hope they are. You're my friend, and I know you've agonized over this measure, but we all know that we need crime control. I don't know that it's the number one issue. I'm sure when they bring health care reform before the committee, there will be those that say that's number one, and those who bring... Uh, welfare reform, they will say that's number one. Well, the crime program uh, eliminates some of the health problems by eliminating the people. You don't have as many people with health problems if we don't do something about this crime. Well, I agree with that, but I, I don't think that the eliminating the crime is to eliminate our, our guns and because it isn't the gun, it's the person who pulls the trigger. I agree with the gentleman. 
I don't know. Uh, did it, you explain where the money is coming from to finance this measure? Yes, sir. The money comes from the trust to be established by attrition within the federal government as anticipated by the OMB over the next six-year period. They anticipate that that will be in the neighborhood of $30.2 billion, about $5 billion per year. And that is the rate at which we would anticipate uh, outlaying the funds within this bill. We authorized and, in effect, appropriated that $30 billion, and it will be spent over a six-year period. The uh, funds are to be spent, a rough breakdown on allocation. Here's $9 billion for 100,000 cops and 10.5 for prisons, billion. $2.6 billion for federal law enforcement, $7 billion for prevention, $200 million for state courts and local prosecutors, and $40 million for rural drug grants and task force, $145 million for anti-gang initiatives, and $1 billion to shore up border patrol. That's the basic breakdown of the money. And um, I think that it will be there. I think it is a, a good, solid program. It's earmarked for that. The social programs involved with the various funding, as the gentleman from New York pointed out, is that a new... Uh, it's not all new. Most of it is. <clears throat> We've had boot camps, as I said, around the country before. We have some existent, but this would extend those boot camps to encourage states uh, at their option to have boot camps and to have alternative uh, programs of various times for uh, first-time nonviolent offenders. Uh, we have some financial assistance aimed at curbing juvenile gangs and at curbing the use and sale of illegal drugs by young people in schools. And as you know, we have drug treatment for state and federal prisoners in an effort to get them out of the habit. If they've been in jail a while, give them that training the last three to six months that they're there and hope that they can make it when they get back on the street. I think preventive is worth trying, uh, Mr. Quillen. As I told you, we spent a hundred years throwing them in the can, throwing them in jail, and they come out, and instead of being amateur criminals, they're hardened professional criminals. And I think that uh, this is an effort to uh, break that mold, do something different try and make an adjustment and save these people so we don't have fourth and fifth time losers, generation losers. Three strikes and you're out, what happened? Three strikes, you get life, life sentence if your last crime was a violent crime. I think we need to tighten them. We got it in there. We need to tighten our, our well, prison <clears throat> system and our justice system. We must do something. And I want to commend you for the fine job that you and your committee always do. It's always a pleasure to have you before this committee. I mean that personally. Well, thank you, Chief. Thank you. Jack, if you were not recommending these new social programs to address the problems of the young, you'd have to probably be coming in with the same kind of money to, to build more prisons. I, I, would that be the case? I mean, either you prevent Well, that's it. what's been the case so far. Mm. If you don't do anything else about it, you keep increasing the number of prisoners that need to be in the clean. You have to build more prisons. States are building billions of dollars worth of prisons right now to handle the 96% of the crime that is state and local. Only 4% of it is federal. And we are not trying to take over the state's responsibilities. We're extending a helping hand in some instances in prison building and in prevention so that their job can be accomplished. They don't always have the money to do it. They're already hard pressed to build new facilities. But I hear the, uh, the, the calls. I go around to the uh, post office visits and the town halls that you know, women come in afraid to walk the streets, uh, you yeah. know, call up the fellow next door to do their shopping. And, I mean, this is just not any quality of life I'm proud of or no. proud We've of. We've got to do better than on. that. Yeah. The Honorable Congressman from the state of Missouri, Mr. Wheat.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just thank you for flying in last night to be here too. Well, Appreciate your efforts on this bill. Mr. Chairman, thank you for that acknowledgement. I look forward to voting for this bill as I travel around not only my district but the state of Missouri. There's no question in, in my mind but that what we do about crime is the biggest issue on people's minds. And if there's anything where the quality of life it's deter has deteriorated in recent years, it is it's living with fear that people have that no matter when they go out of their doors or in fact sometimes when they remain in their doors that crime is going to visit them. And I think that you have done an excellent job on this bill recognizing that fighting crime is a two-track approach. We not only have to be tough on criminals, but we have to promote our own citizens also and, and provide the prevention programs that you include in this bill. In particular, I think the concept of boot camps that you were just talking about really can close the gap in the criminal justice system. Right now, all too often with juveniles, we either uh, ignore the crimes because they, they are younger and younger children committing them, especially in gang-related activities. It's not just 15 and 16-year-olds. It's now children often as young as, as 11 or 12. Or we wait until the crimes get to be so bad that we try them as adults and we send them to the academies of crime that we call prisons and they do come back as hardened criminals instead of as better citizens. So I, I congratulate you for uh, the innovation that you have in this bill. Uh, I look forward to supporting it here in the Rules Committee and I look forward to supporting it on the floor. Thank you very much for that support. Thank you, Mr. Wheat. Mr. Dreyer, Thank you very from much, California. Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I, too, join in congratulating you for uh, all of your efforts here, Mr. Chairman. But I've got to say that uh, Mr. Solomon raised some understandable concern about the inability of our membership to see and have access to all of the brilliant work that you all have done. You said that you have a list of the scope violations. I wondered if you might uh, at least let members of the committee here know what those scope violations are as this committee proceeds with trying to determine whether or not we're going to report out a rule that would make those things in order. What are some of the specific concerns that, uh, that were raised well, there? Well, the that staff we... felt that they had some Senate amendments that might exceed the scope and... Uh, some non-germane amendments? Other. Well, I didn't have a name of them, and, but you understand that um, <clears throat> if you don't have a rule on a, on a bill like this, Somebody goes through it with a fine tooth comb and finds every little facet that might have been this much beyond the scope of the two original bills. And a point of order might technically lie, which would set aside the whole conference report. Yeah. I would find that uh, uh, counterproductive. Yeah. Well, those are basically the rules of the House, and it seems to me that we them. have a responsibility to look as carefully as we can uh, at this measure. I join in, in uh, saying that I want to support a crime bill. I would hope that you will. And I want to deal with a lot of those items that have been raised here. Uh, but I'm concerned about the item that you're concerned about, and I'm also concerned about the sense that we could take a concept which has failed since the Great Society, and I know you supported that whole concept, and perpetuated here in a way to prevent crime. I just don't believe that that is going to be the panacea that so many people uh, argue it will. Tony talked about the benefit of $1.8 billion no that's panacea. going to be going to our... Well, but there are many people, Mr. No Chairman... No panacea. Who, well, this you is may say that, Mr. Chairman. No, no, no. There are many people who seem to believe that this will be that. I've heard that. From well, that is a dream. Yeah. This is not the sole solution to crime. Mm -hmm. This is a step in the right direction. Well, Anybody so, that thinks this is going to solve all the world's problems have been smoking again. Some aspects of it not are survive. some aspects of it are a step in the right direction. Clearly, sure and we all believe that. But there are other aspects which clearly are not a step in the right direction. You raised the issue of the assault weapons ban. The other uh, items, I believe, as we uh, I mentioned, the 1.8 billion dollars uh, to local government. It basically provides them with a blank check when we have very serious uh, financial problems here. I also am concerned about the way in which we're going to pay through this trust fund. As you look at the at the uh, the structure of this trust fund that's there, I think that there are some very serious questions that need to be raised about where we find that 30.2 billion dollars over a six-year period. I think that that these are questions which remain for me, and that's why I'm going to have a very difficult time uh, as we look at it, supporting something, unless I can get some firm answers. Well, you questions. just need to have more faith. Hmm. Well, I have regularly had a great deal of faith in you, Mr. Chairman. You know that. And uh, 
I've listened to your advice and counsel on a wide range of issues. You haven't and taken all of it. No, you're right. I haven't taken all of it. But uh, that's why I'm going to look forward to getting some more information on this crime bill before we support it. And I thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Right. Chairman. Mr. Portagas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I apologize for having to leave the room for a moment. And I, uh, I gather I uh, missed some testimony on the gunman, which I'll catch up on. But that's not my, my real concern. I think everybody really wants a crime bill that will work. And my prediction is that we have once again here, uh, and I say this with all respect, uh, come up with a way to throw an awful lot of money around without any real accountability. I've looked at some of these uh, programs that are meant to be uh, catch crime at the, uh, at the source end rather than the treatment end, uh, and there doesn't seem to be any accountability. And I just, in fact, heard one of our distinguished colleagues on the floor making a speech about a pilot program uh, in her uh, city uh, this year, which uh, apparently is modeled uh, after something that's in here. And the idea is just virtually spread money around to do anything that will work, anything with a youth target. Uh, nobody seems to be able to define anything. I look at uh, model intensive grants, which is only 895 million in this uh, 30 plus billion program, to high crime areas, and, and it says here, this program has no specific requirements, contains vague guidelines for funding. For example, money will go to programs that, quote, provide meaningful and lasting alternatives to crime, unquote. Now, I'm reading from one of our crib sheets here. Mr. Because Falk, let me set your please, mind at ease. Please do. One moment. I to told the Attorney General the other day that I was going to spend the next two years after we pass this bill looking at exactly how each of these programs is implemented, what the results are, how they spend the money, what the guidelines are, how each one of them is done. I'm determined to see that these preventive crime measures, as well as the state and federal and prison health, is utilized properly, and that we get something out of it, that there is an actual yield, and, uh, and I'm going to spend an awful lot of time next year working on just that. Well, Mr. Chairman, I take you at your word because you are a man of your word, and I'm glad you're going to do it. I also know you're pretty good with a fine-tooth comb on numbers, and so I'm looking forward to that. But, but let me just tell you what, what raises my, my concern level, uh, even knowing that you're going to be out there as a deficit hawk on this. Grants are to develop under the Youth Violence Program uh, for, to develop programs in the area of juvenile violence. Terrific. The program should include alternatives to school suspension and other innovative projects. That's, I mean, that to me is just gobbledygook. That just says we're going to spend money, nobody's going to be accountable. Uh, we go into the midnight sport thing, which I'm sure somebody must have talked about. Uh, no, they have. Well, let me just talk about it then, Mr. Chairman, because this, this clearly... Uh, uh, virgin area there. <laughs> well, you know, that's, that's good to know there, there is such an area in this uh, bill. Um, I, I just want to talk about this. At least half the players in each league must live in taxpayer-financed housing. Communities served by these grants must have at least two of the following characteristics. This is for the $40 million uh, Midnight Sports Program. Two of the following characteristics, high levels of HIV-infected people, high crime rates, high drug use, high pregnancy rates, high unemployment, and high dropout rates. Now, it seems to me that w what we're really doing uh, here is saying you've got to be awful bad before you get any money, any of the taxpayers' money. Well, on the other hand, what we're trying to do is take the worst of the lot and try and help them do better. And, and throwing money, and, and then the remedy for all of these problems are these midnight sports program. In other words, we're going to solve the no, high drug use. Else. Gives people something to do besides hang around in the street looking for more trouble. Well, are we going to have it's more productive? It's a more productive thing for young people to do. They'll have more fun doing it. Uh, so the government has now taken over the role of providing fun for the young people. I, I, I don't there think that's fighting crime. I agree, but it's I think you should pay for it yourself, Mr. And Chairman. Killing and robbing and stealing and mugging people, then I'm for fun. Well, Mr. Chairman, I'm for fun too, but I pay for it myself, and I think we all ought to. Uh, I, I think that the problem is we're missing the point here in these social programs. As an American, you're required to know the difference between right and wrong, and you ought to be prepared to accept the penalty if you do wrong. And nobody says you're going to get a reward if you do right. You might, and I hope you do, but nobody says it's guaranteed. But let's leave the social programs and go to the real meat of the problem with this, uh, this particular uh, challenge we've got today. We've got 
no, no particular conference report in front of us. Now, if I heard you right in your general testimony, we've got a general outline with some major conference highlights, the index of the crime bill, but nobody's still seen the whole thing yet. Actually, uh, General Neal, Please. I, I understand you can see this at the chairman's office. And we, I, call I, I didn't know that. I'm sorry. Isn't that, is that, so that is correct. Yeah. But at, I called you, Mr. Solomon, and we made some other calls, too. Right. As we speak. It is available there. Is it finished? It is now being uh, checked over by the Legislative Council. They are now printing it. And when they put it together, we are checking it as they make the changes. We spent all weekend proofing their original effort. 900 pages is a lot of work. Mr. Chairman, I know how hard you and your I mean, staff have worked, and I give you a lot of credit for that. We have that copy available for everybody on, at 1.30, and it will go to the printers this afternoon. We'll have printed copies hardbound in the morning. So that means members of Congress could reasonably have this report by tomorrow morning, you hope? Oh, yeah. Okay. Now, how printed long, how long will these printed copies the, be? The rough copy is available now in my office if you wanted to go there and look at some particular section. Of so it's about this much? That's correct. I couldn't make it smaller. No, I understand. It's not an easy subject. Now, but on the other hand, you said you're ready to go to the floor tomorrow or the next day on this. How many members of Congress have going to look at this has historic legislative achievement, in your words, and had a chance to digest it? Most of it? them since 1991, when we passed basically a crime bill then, a major crime bill, passed it in the House, and they passed it in the Senate, and went to conference, came back, and passed the conference in the House. Basically the same bill. And we all took a look at it then. It stayed in the Senate for 11 months, and they didn't pass it. Now, that same material is available. This material has been available. These hearings were public. All of this material is available. You can read about this till you turn... Mr. Well, Chairman, I've got to tell you that I, I appreciate what you say, and I know there's been a lot of discussion on the crime bill, and we've had a lot of debate in the House and uh, followed yeah. it very closely. But There's there no secret what's in it. We're delighted have come over there. We'll give you material. You can read it all. There are, there are some new things that I've read since, uh, since this process has started, since you completed your conference work, uh, that have been new to me. Some of those things I read off about some of these social programs are very clearly new to me uh, and somewhat unsettling. The, the other thing that's new to me is that I took a look at the price on this and we're missing $11 billion. Uh, and are missing $11 billion? Well, I just added it up. What $11 billion are you missing? Well, uh, we've got a $33 billion project. We've got uh, $2.85 billion is authorized under the bill, but not funded through the trust fund. That has to come from someplace. And then we've got an $8.2 billion shortfall in the trust fund, according to our numbers. I don't believe that's correct. Uh, well, I'll, I will pursue that further with your staff because... Uh, I think that is inaccurate. I think that the uh, $30 billion is well accounted for and all appropriated for. And, and, and uh, Joe Biden and I made an early agreement that we weren't going to uh, fund a lot of things or promote a lot of things that were not covered in the trust fund. Well, let me put it this way. I suppose if we get 100% of the savings from the federal jobs, their numbers might look a little better. Right. But even so, the trust fund's supposed to re receive 32, 30 point 30 two billion over two. a six-year period. 30 billion point two. Yeah, which apparently understanding that we have a shortfall of about $8 billion which will have to be made up from other what, sources. Shortfall? That's in the trust fund. I'll take our staff numbers right. and work well, with I'm, your staff. I'm, I would uh, feel what? sure that that is not in accordance with the numbers they've given us, Expire. or the Senate, okay. or the President, or the OMB. Okay, I'm told $13 billion is coming in after the budget caps expire, and I'll talk more with you about this. My, my figures I've got here don't add up. Right. We're short a lot. Um, the... Um, the other area, I guess, that we talked about the social programs and the accountability, and you've given me your personal assurances on that, which are very helpful for me, but I'm not sure will be enough for, for, um, for all of the other people who require that we keep account. Uh, we're, we're still waiting for the report. I've, I've got some questions about whether we really do have a shortfall or not. And then uh, it, there's another area here on death row appeals. I didn't see anything, despite all our debate in here, uh, in, in the papers I've been able to see, and I haven't seen them all, that there's been any change in the processing of the death row uh, sentencing and the appeals process. There have been no improvements despite a lot of discussion on that. Is that correct? Habeas corpus is not covered in this. Yes. Thank you. You remember when we had habeas corpus last year? I do indeed. And a Republican motion killed it all. You remember that? 
I don't remember that part. I remember that part. Well, we, we have a different memory on that. The record, though, is the same. I'll do it later. Okay. Well, and the other, the final point, and, and the issue at hand is to come up with a fair rule uh, for this historic legislative achievement uh, so that it does get due deliberative process by all members on a fully under, understanding basis. Uh, and I am very concerned that uh, we're not going to do that unless we know uh, what the scope and the uh, germane items uh, are that we're going to protect. I'd like to have a little list of what it is we're waiving uh, the rules on. Uh, I think that's extremely important. And I fully accept your explanation about the technicalities. I agree. I'm not worried about the you technicalities. It's the main points. A list. If I had a list written, because they'd use it against you and go to the floor and say, here are items that he admits are beyond the scope. That's right. No, but I don't do that. Well, I know. Well, you see, it's my job to make you say that. I suspect that there are some. Well, I suspect there I are suspect some, too. I suspect strong enough to want a rule. All you have to do on the rule is say you give a rule to go to the floor, and they don't have amendments to it, and they have one hour on the rule, one hour on the suspension, and that's it. Mr. Chairman, you're ab up or down on that. You're absolutely right. The only problem with that... asking for amendments or special time or... Special agreements, nothing, just simple. Right. The only, only problem with that is we do more than one rule here every so often. We do more and more rules. Well, and the question is the of fair play. This is the simplest kind that you do. Excuse this me? This is the simplest kind that you do. There's no problem to it. Well, if we're going to waive points of order for everybody who comes in and that's say... That's what a rule always does. If we do well, that... Oh, that no. Well, we, I mean, that's the only reason I come to get a rule. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Chairman, that puts some other members at a real disadvantage. Yeah, well, <laughs> Yeah, I know. I, it's your right to put other members at a disadvantage. It's my right to say that uh, other members are at a disadvantage, and that's what we're about here. I, Mr. Chairman, I thank you. You've been very patient, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, I, I know you've got to get down to your committee and uh, work on the antitrust thing, but uh, believe me, people are calling out for some crime measure, and I think this is the measure that they're looking well, for. We're right doing now. our best to meet that public need. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mokin. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Stone. The Honorable Bill McCollum of Florida. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, as you might imagine, I have a slightly different view from Chairman Brooks on this bill. <laughs> I would imagine. And uh, first of all, I'd like to say that my primary purpose being here, other than to explain that view and to have a conversation with the members so you can get a broader perspective, is to say that I hope in the rule that the bottom line at least allows the minority the usual opportunity to offer motion to instruct a conferees, uh, not to instruct conferees, a motion to recommit with instructions, I should say. Mm -hmm. And uh, if that uh, is the case, we would certainly like to particularly tackle some of the deficiencies I'm going to explain to you today uh, in this process. First of all, in the broad perspective of this legislation, there are some good things in this bill. I think we have to understand what's in it and what isn't in it. Uh, the good that's in this bill is, for the most part, a a revision of the laws that will now allow us to reinstate the federal death penalty that has not been possible for most federal crimes, including assassinating the, the President of the United States since 1972, when the Supreme Court of the United States struck that provision in its technical way down uh, throughout the United States, including the states. And we, at the federal level, have been remiss in not putting the correct penalty procedures in place in order to be able to reinstate the death penalty. Uh, that would be done in this bill, although I share with my colleague from Pennsylvania who will be giving you his own views in a few minutes that there are some deficiencies in the process that we've undertaken to accomplish that. But nonetheless, uh, we do finally, after all those 22 plus years, uh, get around at the federal level in this bill to reinstating the death penalty. I also think that the structure of the prison system in this bill, the prison grant program, is a good structure. Uh, it does require truth and sentencing for the monies that are available. It would require, at the very least, for states to get at least 40% of the money in the trust funds, that they uh, change their laws so that second-time re uh, violent repeat offenders would have to serve at least 85% of their sentences. Now, for 60% of the monies available, uh, they would not have to really do much of anything, in my judgment. But considering compromises and where people were, uh, the structure on the prison part of this is very positive. I think also positive is some of the stalking provisions that are in here and the efforts to protect us against uh, those who commit some very heinous crimes. And I could go on with a litany of things. There are quite a number in here that are very positive. On the other hand, what's not in this bill at all is equally important. As Chairman Brooks just said, uh, we have failed completely to address 
the problem federal courts have created and the federal government of the endless appeals that death row inmates have. We just ducked that issue completely in this Congress. Secondly, there's nothing in this bill, we weren't even allowed to offer it on the floor of the House, if you recall, uh, to address what many of the local police continue to complain about vigorously, and that is the rules of, of procedure and evidence that do not allow uh, those kinds of things in in search and seizure cases, which would get them convictions. We have technical grounds that are excluding far too much evidence, and we had opportunities that have passed this House of ours twice in the past to deal with it. That's not in the bill. Now, I would like to talk, though, about what the really big problem with this bill is, and it is the allocation of resources. This is a $30 billion-plus bill. The authorization for this bill is uh, over $33 billion. $30.2 billion is in the so-called trust fund monies that Chairman Brooks was explaining uh, presumably is going to come from savings we get from retirement, early retirement of federal employees and the attrition that goes on there. That is very uh, questionable whether we'll get all of that money, and I think that's what Mr. Goss's questioning was going to. But assuming for the moment we look just at that $30 billion, I call that the real money because I don't have any misgivings. The Appropriations Committee is unlikely to do much in the way of appropriating in the budget crunch we've got anything further than that the 30 billion uh, or 30.2 billion the biggest problem i've got is that we've talked all along about the importance of prisons we've talked about the fact that six percent which is true six percent of the criminals of this country commit better than seventy percent of the violent crimes and are serving only about a third of their sentences they're going through the revolving door and they're getting out again and committing these violent crimes again and again and again and if there is one objective the American public really wants us to achieve in this legislation, it is to provide assistance to the states where most of this crime is committed, to build sufficient prisons, and to change their laws to take these violent criminals off the streets and make them serve as much of the full measure of their sentence as possible, certainly far more than a third of their sentences. The Bureau of Prisons told us early on that in order to do this just for the repeat second time violent offenders, we were going to have to give the states or provide for the states about ten and a half billion dollars minimum. If you recall, there was thirteen billion dollars for prisons and prison grant programs in the House bill that went to conference. In this bill that's coming back out of conference, there's only six and a half billion dollars for prisons out of a thirty billion dollar trust fund. Only six and a half billion. Only about a fifth of the entire money in this bill goes for the primary purpose that most of us who looked at it thought that the money that we were working on should be going to. We haven't gotten the right amount. We haven't got half, or maybe right at half at best, of what the House proposed. We certainly don't have what the Bureau of Prisons said is required, not for the first time violent offender to be incarcerated and kept up for truth and sentencing, but for the second time repeat violent offender. And I think therein really lies the rub. What we have instead in this bill are the equivalent on the prevention side, the social welfare side, which is largely what this is, of what we've had described by the Cato Institute as three full new CETA programs that Mr. Solomon uh, argued about or mentioned a moment ago. Or, as Mr. Moore at Cato says, the equivalent of 10 new UDAG programs, both of which were failed programs of the past, trying to provide jobs and welfare programs in some way to stop or prevent crime or help our inner cities. Since 1965, we have spent as a nation nearly $5 trillion on social welfare spending. And yet over that same period of time, we've seen an increase in violent crime at better than 500%. I think the answer clearly from the data that's already in is that you can't throw money to the local communities to solve the violent crime problem or the crime problem of this nation and expect it to work. You just can't throw more money out. And that's what much of this bill does, about eight billion to nine billion dollars is going to go for what are loosely called prevention programs but are really nothing more than these CETA and UDAG and job programs at least 90 or 95 percent of what's there. I heard somebody mention a minute ago boot camps. I'm not sure there's a dollar in here for boot camps. It's great to talk about them. I'm all for experimenting where they're appropriate. They're not appropriate in every case but what is here is very minimal at best for boot camps. That's not the question. Uh, also, what's not at question necessarily, though maybe it should be, is the money for more police. Most of us want more cops on the streets, but the problem with more cops on the streets in this bill is pretty severe. There's supposed to be money uh, for 100,000 more of them. Yet the Heritage Foundation is coming out with a study today that's going to show that the funds in this bill will probably not fund more than 20,000. And in addition to that fact, you're going to wind up dumping a lot of the cost of this off onto the state and local governments. Uh, you're simply not doing something that the local police really want you to do. But we've talked a lot about it. Sounds good. And we're all for the concept, but it's not what's happening in here. 
And maybe even a more telling statistic the Heritage Foundation is going to come out with today in their report they're issuing later, maybe they've done it this morning already, is their study of the funding in this bill overall shows that on the so-called prevention area, you'll be hiring two social workers for every cop on the street that you get in this bill. Two social workers. Uh, it, the, the midnight basketball is only a small technical part of this bill. It's about $50 million program, but it sort of is the code word for what's wrong with the bill. Uh, I happen to like midnight basketball programs. They're funded in my local community with limited resources that are there. A lot of communities are doing that for, you know, the type of thing they want to have. But why are we going into taking that slogan of midnight basketball when we don't really need to provide federal money for it anyway? The cities can do the job in that area. That's not the expensive end of this. And under the cover of that uh, idea, and saying this has got boot camps and other prevention things in it, which really is not in this bill, going out and creating these old, recreating these old social welfare programs that are failed, these job programs. That was mentioned earlier, the model intensive grant program, $895 million, that is to provide lasting and meaningful alternatives to crime, and we don't even know what they are. The Local Partnership Act would give $1.8 billion to the local community to spend on everything you can imagine, whatever they may dream up, including <laughs> job programs to prevent crime. And the list goes on and on. I'm not going to list every one of them, but I would say the YES program, $650 million, Youth Employment Skills Program, to test the proposition that crime can be reduced through a saturation jobs program. Mr. Chairman, uh, the problem with this bill is that it does not solve the crime problem. It does not allocate the resources the right way. It does not provide sufficient resources for prisons that would be necessary if we're really going to get those who are committing the violent crimes, the repeat offenders off the streets, lock them up and throw away the keys. And at the same time, it goes about fooling the public by saying we're going to put a lot more cops on the streets than we really will or than we can, the local governments to, can afford to sustain. And it then comes through the back door and does uh, the president's, I think, job stimulus program or something pretty close to it by recreating uh, three times as many uh, CETA programs as we had back years ago that we said didn't work, or UDAG programs or what else to have jobs, and say that that's going to somehow solve our crime problem. If we want to get at the, the root causes, we need to get a welfare reform bill before your committee and get it out on the floor and get one that's meaningful to really help us put the families back together again of this nation. Uh, that's the only way we're going to get the root cause of crime. In the meantime, we better darn well put the resources where they count. And that limited amount, at the very least, ought to be about $10.5 billion or $12 billion uh, uh, that would go to prisons and go to the grant programs that's not in the bill. So I would urge that we, uh, on our side, at the very least under this rule, be allowed to offer a motion uh, to recommit uh, with instructions, Mr. Chairman, and so we can get at some of these matters, at least give our members a chance to vote on it. Thank you very much, Mr. McCollum. We appreciate your being here and we appreciate your testimony. You are a valued member of, of this place and especially of the Judiciary Committee, and we, we listen carefully to your, to your testimony today. Let me ask you just two very brief questions, Certainly. if I might. Your principal concerns are, one, that there's too much money for what you describe as social programs or, or things that don't deal necessarily directly with the problem or perhaps won't be all that effective, and two, l lack of adequate money for prisons. Well, that's a, the sum of it, and it's rather radical. In other words, you're dealing I understand, with big understand. difference. I'm just, I'm just but that's your correct. Now, I'm equally concerned, as Chairman Brooks is, I want to ask you a couple of little questions. About, sure, about the gun issue that's in the bill, the assault weapons, which I personally oppose. But I didn't raise it in my main testimony because I think the bill needs to be addressed on other grounds. I appreciate grounds. that. And that's why I went to what I thought were your two principal concerns. I just that's want to correct. ask you two modest Fair questions enough. about them. Certainly. With respect, with respect to an adequate amount of money for prisons, is there anything we can do uh, to, to lower the need for so much additional money as you perhaps I believe we, we need specifically. Are there people still, and there may not be, but I just wanted your advice on it since you're somebody who's sure. knowledgeable about this. Are there people still whom we're keeping in prison perhaps longer than we should, uh, whom we could release perhaps a little earlier and make, and make room for some of the, of the folks that you and I and everybody here agrees ought to be spending more time in prison? Well, modestly around the edges you can do that. You particularly can do that with your criminal aliens that uh, you and I are very familiar with. Our governor in Florida has done a thing I think is good and tried to ship some of them back so we're worried, that we're worried that they're going to come back across the borders if we don't ourselves well, keep that, them in prison. that's right. But and there is $1.8 billion in here to help the states to right. pay no, for No, and we spoke that. about that earlier, but as you heard. But I don't believe that you can do anything about re early releases or changing the complexion of the system that's going to have a meaningful impact on what we need to do now. The problem is so great with vi the violent criminals that unless we put in about $10 billion or so at the minimum, 
uh, into the prison systems of this country, we will not be able to take them off the streets. And that's my unless, opinion based on hearing from a lot of other okay. professors. Well, I appreciate that. You know, unless, in the alternative, we, there are some folks there whom we could let out, as I suggested a little earlier, uh, to make room for them, which would save us a few billion dollars, which would be worthwhile doing too. I Specifically, just can, I just don't think you can let enough okay. out to save the, the few billion you're talking about. It'd be very marginal, maybe a few million. Okay. But no, not I, a few billion. I'm, I'm just asking, and I, I accept your answer. Are there, are there, for example, some nonviolent drug offenders or decent numbers of them currently in, in, in prisons who perhaps uh, don't need to be there quite so long? Well, as you know, maybe you don't know, this bill, one of the other provisions in here, changes the minimum mandatory yes, sentencing structure, which I supported. And uh, so it's a bipartisan effort. It's not all Republicans do, not all Democrats right. do, but it lowers the minimum mandatories for what we call the mules, the people who aren't right. involved at the major drug trafficking area. However, that's not going to be solving the real problem that's here in creating a lot more prison space. It will help, but it will not solve the big problem. Okay. Thank you for your response to that. My second modest question is with respect to the social programs. It's, it's this member's opinion, and, and I'm, I'm overemphasizing it really, that the, that the key prevention program in a sense is one which would, which one would, and it's obviously extremely difficult to do this in an effective and efficacious way, would be, would be to encourage or discourage uh, the scourge of, uh, of illegitimate births to unmarried teenagers in this country. I mean, if you want to get at a root cause for welfare, for a crime, and so on. Uh, I hope that we do something in the way of disincentives when it comes to our welfare bill, which you talked about just a few moments ago. I think that you're exactly correct about that. I take it there's probably nothing in here that would go to that. I don't see question. anything that really goes to that question, Mr. Bielenson. Um, I might add, while I think about it, that the minimum mandatory sentence reduction on the drugs has to do with federal drug yes. crimes, and that this money for prisons is going to the states. So we really don't address that problem in the bill. Okay. Thank you, sir. Mr. I think Mr. Foster, you're next, sir, and then Mr. Whitten. Pull on. Mr. McCollum, could you uh, very briefly tell us what you expect to uh, have in the motion to recommit? Well, we haven't formally drafted it, but the intent at the present time from our discussions would be to shift some money to the prisons to try to see if we can't uh, take it away from programs that we think are not meaningful in here and the, under the trust fund monies to get us closer to, if not to the $10.5 billion the Bureau of Prisons says we should have. Uh, and that's, uh, to me, the number one thing. And we may reduce uh, further some of the spending programs in it uh, that are there that we don't think are appropriate. Uh, that would be the, the drift of where I'm headed right now. Do you anticipate addressing the assault, the assault weapons issue in your motion to recommit? At this present time, I have not uh, considered doing that, though it might occur. I think that, as you well know, there may be a big fight over the rule just on that issue alone with some members. Uh, it wouldn't be surprising. Uh, to see this rule, uh, in my judgment, be defeated and, and go back and see that assault weapon provision addressed by the conference again. But I, I'm just speculating. At the present moment, I've made no commitment one way or the other about the assault weapon issue. And, and you will be the member offering the motion to recommit? I would anticipate that I would be, though the leadership hasn't formally designated it. Uh, I've been in conference with the, Mr. Michael and Mr. Gingrich, and I would anticipate that. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Cohen. You're a valuable member, not only of this body, but of the committee. We appreciate the good work that you do. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. I uh, am concerned about the social welfare spending that might lead into a completely boondoggle down years ahead. Are you likewise concerned about that? I'm very concerned about it, Mr. Quillen. I think we're starting to open up the door for more programs that will be put on the books that are far greater than what we already have. In fact, asking that question, I think, lets me say this, and I'd like to. There are already seven federal de uh, departments of this government sponsoring 266 prevention programs to serve delinquent or at-risk youth. Of these 266 programs, 31 are run by the Education Department, 92 by Health and Human Services, and 117 by the Justice Department. The uh, General Accounting Office looked into this and found, quote, a massive federal effort on behalf of troubled youth, which already spends over $3 billion a year. Now we're going to add at least $8 billion, and some count up to 9 depending on how you categorize a couple of these programs. Uh, new programs to this, which will then be around to presumably, even after the exhaustion of the trust fund monies in six years, be around to be argued to be refunded again. And you know how we get these programs here. They're very hard to kill them. I don't know how many years it took to kill CETA and UDAG, which uh, you may remember we did in the early 80s. Uh, and so I'm very concerned with putting all of this in place, these huge new programs. 
Well, once a program starts, it always has the cost of funding it escalate. That's true. And that's just this is just a put in the water, a step forward, and where it ends, we don't know. But we all know that crime is a terrific problem in this country. Yes, sir. I don't know whether we, in this measure, are approaching it in the right direction or not. But nothing ventured, nothing gained. I don't support provisions of the bill, and I will vote against the rule because I don't think it solves a problem. My, my vote would be mainly because of the social programs uh, embraced and also on the ban on assault weapons. I, for the life of me, I don't know why there are those in this country who want to do away with the constitutional provision that we have the right to bear arms. And I, I, it's not the gun, it's the person who pulls the trigger. The gun's only the conduit. So we need to get to the basis and talk about uh, uh, those who are not sent to prison and who are released because they have funding to get outstanding attorneys and beat the system and then go on to do the same thing again, particularly the drug, drug traffickers. I think we need to tighten our belts. Crime is a problem. I consider it one of the top priorities. Well, Mr. Quillen, uh, I share with you a lot of the same concerns, and I never will forget the Michigan police officer who stood up in a meeting I attended with Congressman Smith a few months ago and said to me, uh, Mr. McCollum, the problem we have out here on the streets is uh, not repeating rifles, it's repeating offenders. And I think that pretty well states the balance, uh, and this bill is imbalanced. That's the problem with it, not just in that area, but in the funding and the emphasis of where it is. We need to get those violent repeat offenders off the streets, and you and I would share the need for a good, tough crime bill. This one just goes overboard in the wrong way. I thank you, and I again want to commend you for the good work that you do, Bill. I don't know when they're going to bring this measure up, but I, I think it'll be very soon. But let's do our very best to defeat the rule, and I'm with you in that. Uh, thank you very much. In that endeavor. Thank, thank you, you for that support. Much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hall of Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. McCollum. I, I too join my colleagues in, in uh, thanking you for your invaluable work on the committee. Uh, I know that you're against a large portion of the bill, but I don't think anybody doubts your sincerity and your hard work, your diligence. Thank you, Mr. Hall. And pursuing uh, the right outcome. I, I would like to, uh, I'd like for you to answer the question, though. Uh, I think you said that we need more money put into prisons and probably less money put into some of the prevention programs. And I, I, don't, I don't quite understand that because how do we get, if we continue to do that, how do we get at the root causes of crime if we don't uh, really go after some of these prevention programs? Well, I guess there's a priority question, first of all, in this. Um, and to me, I've given the illustration many times, the problem with violent crime, which is the number one thing facing the public today in the nation that everybody's thinking about, and, and they have good reason to, uh, is very much in a situation like somebody who's been run over by a truck. And the paramedic finds him on the side of the road, and he's got a lot of internal injuries, and his arm's been cut off, and he's bleeding to death. Well, the first thing that you do, in my judgment, and I think that paramedic's judgment, is to put a tourniquet on that arm to stop the bleeding. Uh, then you can have a chance to get at the root causes or the internal injuries, if you will. And this is the way I look at this. I think that if we don't provide the tourniquet, we don't provide sufficient money for the states to put these people away and to change their laws and encourage them to do that, uh, to lock up these repeat offenders, then uh, the root cause problem is never going to get fully addressed the right way. And secondly, in this bill, I just think that this, a lot of the programs we've got in this bill are rehashes of the old CETA programs, the old UDAG programs, and not as innovative and creative as we need to be. The most innovative thing we could do for root causes is to change the structure of the welfare system, to get a, go ahead and get the welfare reform bill up and do things that I know you and I would share, because I've talked to you a little bit about this before, to get our families back together again. Uh, one of the great root cause problems of crime is homes that don't have fathers, that, that you have only single parents and kids that are seven, eight, nine, ten years old have no guidance to go off with these gangs and all. 
That's really far more meaningful than the programs that are in this bill. I wish I could say these programs were beneficial, and a few of them are. I don't want to cast aspersions on every one of them. But you're talking about $8 billion or $9 billion of programs, of which maybe a billion, maybe two at the most, would be something that I think could be considered uh, truly innovative and meaningful. What about the, uh, to follow up on that, what about the kids even in this city right here that are 14, 15 years old, some of which, some of them, and it's been reported in the newspapers, have, uh, they're preparing their funerals, they're preparing to die, they're not preparing to live because they live in such a difficult neighborhood, full of crime, there's been so much hate, so many killings, that, uh, you know, some of them are even planning their funerals and what music is going to be at their funerals because they don't expect to get past 16, 17 years of age. How do you, well, if we don't have prevention programs and we don't have more policemen on the street as this bill provides, how do we get at the root well, causes? Well, I'm not suggesting we don't have some more police on the streets, but I'd suggest in the District of Columbia there's a study out that's very interesting that says, I don't know, 70, 80 percent of the murders in this town over the last three or four years, the studies, the DNA studies and the hand, uh, all of the scientific studies show that just a handful of people are committing those crimes. You have repeat violent offenders. And if we want to do something about the neighborhoods, you've got to go out and first get those people and lock them up and make sure when they get locked up for whatever they're getting locked up for, it might not be murder, but some other violent crime, they don't go back out again. And, and that's going to do more by far for the city of Washington than anything that's in this bill in the so-called prevention area. Again, I don't fault everything in this bill, but what I fault are like, you know, a number of these things that are just open-ended. I mentioned earlier the model uh, program, the intensive program that's in here that says open-ended. You can do anything you want to do uh, with the money. Uh, and, and job programs as such are just money down the drain. I wish they weren't, but that's been my experience, of, especially putting them in here for the targets like they are. We've had those programs in the past under CETA and all, and they've just failed in terms of, of this purpose anyway. Thank you, Mr. McCollum. Thank you for Oh, Mr. Solomon, excuse me. Sure. It's all right, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Bill, we really do appreciate the outstanding work you do. You probably are one of the uh, two or three most knowledgeable members in this whole body uh, uh, on the issue before us. And uh, I just have uh, great problems with, uh, with the approach that we're taking uh, going back to the CETA programs that I discussed earlier that you just finished discussing, uh, discussing. but, uh, you know, back in the late 60s and early 70s, we went into these CETA programs, which were government-run training programs. That's right. And they trained nobody, and they were total disasters and just a, a waste of money from one end to the other. And everybody realized that. And then we changed that whole concept, and we went into... Uh, providing funds to the private sector. It was called the Job Training Partnership Act. It was just one. And we did it for the veterans. And we did it for, but we, we actually made those programs available to the big Fortune 500s, the GEs, and the um, international paper companies, and the IBMs. But we made it available to small entrepreneurial businessmen. And they, they hired people. They used these funds. And they were fairly successful as successful as any of these kind of things can, can be. And here we are reversing all of that. And these programs are going to be a total disaster, a total waste of money. I agree. And that's I agree. Why, and, you know, for people like me, I mean, I, you know, I want desperately to vote for a Crime Control Enforcement Act. Uh, but I sure am not going to vote for this with all of this, this grab bag of, uh, of programs that nobody is going to be able to administer. And, uh, and carry out, and we're, then we're going to be coming back here year after year after year to fund these things, and the deficit is going to grow. And I, I just, uh, I'm almost beside myself when I, when I look at, at this, and, and you didn't read all these off. I'm going to put this in the record. Mr. Chairman, might I have unanimous consent to put a summary of the social welfare spending in the crime bill? Might I have you know, consent to present this? Objection. Because there are literally dozens of these programs. And as Porter Goss uh, brought out in his questioning, uh, many of which aren't even figured into this total. And we just are not going to know what we're doing when we vote on this, on, uh, uh, if we vote on it this week. And I hope we don't. Uh, and I've just been talking to 
my good friend, the Chairman Moakley, and other members that uh, hopefully this will not come on the floor before Friday, at least, which would give us three days to, uh, to try to find out what's in the bill, well, and hopefully not until next week. Well, Mr. Solomon, I would concur in that last comment and, and say to Mr. Chairman that it is a 900-page volume, and I've had to work on understanding everything that's in there, even though I went through the whole conference, and I've lived with this now for the entire development process. I would think that ordinary member who has not had that exposure is going to need a chance to balance that, whether it's a Democrat or Republican, and I would not think a day or two would matter much. A conference report takes an hour for the rule and an hour for the floor, maybe, right. give or take. Um, so I would agree particularly with Mr. Solomon on that point. I hadn't said it earlier, but uh, it would be very helpful if we could have a day or two in between after that thing's published. Well, of course, you know, the Rules Committee doesn't set the, no, the time I on understand. the floor, but uh, I don't think the gentleman's proposal is out of line. I would just ask you to encourage it in your leadership, that's all. I, 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 I think Mr. Moakley will try to be helpful to us Good. in that respect. And I thank the gentleman. Well, I thank you, Mr. Solomon. It's nice to have my conscience so close to me, huh? <laughs> uh, Mr. Billinson? Mr. Hall? Mr. Quillen? Oh, uh, Mr. Dreyer? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me uh, join with my colleagues in stating, Bill, that uh, you have been in an extraordinary position. We all want to deal with the issue of crime, and this is the crime bill. And anyone who is challenging the crime bill could be perceived by many to be somehow tolerant of the crime problem that we have in this country. Chairman Moakley referred to the fact that every poll that he has seen shows how uh, people are concerned about it. And when he's visiting his district, people voice concern about it. We all have that. You have stepped forward and raised some tough, but very important questions that need to be raised about this issue of crime, and I want to congratulate you for having the courage of your convictions on this. Well, thank you, Mr. Dreyer. Now, let me, let me uh, ask you one particular question that I raised earlier with Mr. Brooks. We're concerned about scope violations and non-germane amendments that are coming out of the conference report. And it seems to me that as we look at this, uh, we're talking also about scheduling, bringing this to the floor, uh, we have many items which are just now coming to the fore, to our attention, that has emerged from the conference report. So I guess my question would be for you. I mean, you have been on the front line. You have spent a better part of your career here in the Congress working on the issue of crime. Have you read through this entire conference report? No, I haven't had a chance to read through it. it you mean to say that compliant. all the time you've spent on this, and uh, you have gone through this conference. You have not read the entire well, conference. Let me, let me How can we bit. be expected to vote on this bit. thing That's if right. you haven't read the conference report? Bill, I'm looking to you for leadership. Well, we're going we're gonna to read the conference report before it's over with. But let me tell you how this really works. And, and this is not to try to be unduly critical because I had a good relationship with Chairman Brooks over much of this time. But to give you an example of how it really works, and when the final cuts are being made on a lot of these programs around midnight last week, a Wednesday, Thursday, uh, the room was closed, and you go back in and have a kind of a closed-door meeting to try to work it out. Senator Biden and Congressman Brooks went back in there, and Senator Biden took Senator Simpson with him. But uh, Mr. Brooks did not choose to take a single Republican back there. And I frankly don't know what all the technicals are in here. We're going to have our staff this. work over that over the next—they're working on it now. Bill now that we're seeing that we sit down there, we're going over it, we're going to find the fine tooth. But there are probably things in this bill that uh, anybody on the Republican side has worked with it right up close, including staff, aren't going to know about. Bill, when are you planning to read the conference report? Well, if I get a chance to read it over the next two or three do you days, have a copy uh, of we'll it? read it. But I won't, do you, do you I won't have, have 900. I won't have 900 pages read personally by tomorrow morning. If this do you have a copy of it? Afternoon. No, I don't have a copy of it. Where is a copy of it? As far as I know, Chairman Brooks just got through telling this committee while I sat in here that there is a rough copy. They're working on the technicals to get it printed on his desk. If you want to come by while they're working on the single. Copy. So in other words, we. So in other words, when I asked you why you haven't read the conference report, it's because it's not available? It's not available in the present form. That's right. It's not been printed. It will not be printed, I presume, until this afternoon. Your Honor, the lawyer is leading the witness. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You do a pretty good job, though. Uh -huh. Are you all done, Mr. Dreher? Put the rope away now. Mr. Goss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. McCollum, you indeed have uh, helped me a great deal with this bill, even though neither of us have been able to read it because it's not available yet with the conference report. 
but you've certainly opened my eyes to some of the problems, and I appreciate you coming forward and doing that and for hanging in there and standing up for some of what is the real shortfall here. My prediction for this bill, should it actually pass, and I hope it doesn't in its present form, even though I desperately want to vote for a crime bill, is that the American people will discover that crime has not gone away, that it's going to be just as bad as ever, that we will have spent $33 billion, and people are going to feel mad, and they're going to feel ripped off. And I suspect that's what's going to happen if we pass this bill, uh, this conference report. And I hope that's not true. But uh, from what I'm seeing and reading, uh, we're missing the mark badly. Uh, and, and to point to that in, in, a, in a just um, in a, in a brief aside and to underscore the point you said about dealing with real crime here and, and trying to get away from the midnight basketball business, which may have some merit, but I'm not sure we should be treating that as the highest priority in our crime bill. Um, I, I happened to be in the New York area uh, yesterday, and the whole issue there was the outrage in a neighborhood in suburban area outside of New York, happened to actually be in New Jersey, uh, about a seven-year-old who was strangled uh, by uh, a neighbor in the community. And it turned out that apparently, allegedly, this is one of uh, three uh, pedophiles who are living together and had been entrusted, uh, you know, with, uh, into the neighborhood by the neighbors and so forth. These were known uh, problem makers and had a problem. And it seems to me that the comment that one of the neighbors who was just a, you know, a, a good Joe American uh, looked up and he and just outraged and upset and sad. And he said, we've got it exactly upside down in this country. And I think that's what this bill is, exactly upside down. Uh, I understand the mayor of New York, uh, maybe it wasn't the mayor, but if it wasn't the mayor, it was somebody else uh, in a high position on these, these law enforcement uh, funds for additional law enforcement personnel, aware of the CETA trap that these funds are going to roll out, said, I'm not going to buy more law enforcement officers with these dollars. I'm going to buy computers. And that'll free up my present law enforcement officers from the paperwork they have to do and maybe give them street, street time. Now, maybe that's a good idea. Maybe it's not a, a good idea. I don't know, but it sounds to me like this crime conference report took place all hours of the day. You worked endurance hours, and you didn't have any police chiefs in the room uh, or people who really understand what's going on in the front lines. Uh, I, I suppose lightening the load on the, the front line officers makes a lot of sense, but I don't think anybody voted for computers uh, in this process. I think they thought they were doing something right by voting for more law enforcement personnel to go out on the streets. And if that's the kind of thing that is going to happen, that's an unintended consequence, may be favorable and one may not be. That's just a simple area. When you go through the pages and pages and pages, the summary that uh, Mr. Solomon has introduced into the record of these social programs which have no accountability, billions of dollars involved in them, it seems to me we've missed the mark. And, you know, from your opinion of somebody been involved with this for a long time, am I off base thinking that? No, you're that? really not off base, Mr. Goss. Uh, in a conference, in every conference, uh, I guess there is some looseness to it because you have to have an agreement between the Senate and the House members who are there. And there takes a considerable amount of time over certain key issues. But there are many others that are going by left and right that particularly the minority doesn't get much chance to read the fine print on. In fact, there might not be any. Usually there's an agreement and then somebody writes the language out later. And that's why we're, we're saying here, as in my response to Mr. Dreyer, Mr. Solomon, and others, it's so important for us to be able to see the final language. We don't know what altogether is in there. And then your bottom line point overall is very, very true. As I've tried to make clear here today before this committee, uh, this bill is not balanced. I've heard many members say that they want balance in here. Uh, the prison portion, which should be number one in this bill, is less than, well, it's right out of fifth. I, should, I don't want to be misrepresenting. Right at one-fifth of the total money in here, you've got a 30-plus billion dollar proposal, and you've got only about six to a half billion dollars for prison construction, when the Bureau of Prisons said you've got to have at least ten and a half billion just to help the states get at the repeat violent offenders who are coming back in the second time. You know, that doesn't help them build prison space to house the ones who are there the first time or to go to truth and sentencing. They're only really serving, as you know, an average of about a third of their sentences overall with these things. And then you're, you're going out and spending uh, more than the six and a half billion. You're spending about eight or nine on all these social root cause welfare spending CETA programs. The bill is just imbalanced. I don't like just well, very imbalanced, in my opinion. I, I, I appreciate you sharing that because I trust your judgment very much on it. Um, you've been involved for so long and done such a good job on the issue. Um, and I mean that. I seriously mean well, thank that. Thank you. Um, the, uh, the other question, I, and I know this is not necessarily the area you were focusing on, but I, going over the costs, uh, I've gone over my numbers again, and I find indeed that we are going to have a shortfall of uh, perhaps some $8 billion, 
that is supposed to come from this um, this much discussed uh, reduction of 252,000 federal jobs that are supposed to come about through attrition. And if all goes well there, we will get 22 billion. But charged against that 22 billion are 30.2 billion dollars worth of expenditures. Uh, plus, we've got this other 2.85 billion that's authorized but not funded under the bill. So when I say we're 11, sh 11 billion short, am I wrong? No, you're. Uh, if you're, you're sounding right. I don't know about the 8 billion. I don't have the figures you've got in front of you. But I have thought all along that we were fudging. Uh, on the question of how much money the trust fund would ultimately get because these are based upon estimates and we don't really know that and there's statistical averages that I suspect you have that would show that we really won't get 30 billion dollars out of this. That's why I work so hard to try to convince the majority in the conference to provide a particular provision they refused to do that said that we cordon off the amount of money we want to spend for prisons at, ver at the very least and say that that gets first dig every year of the money that is available. Otherwise, you're going to spend even less than the six and a half billion because they have even less than that available to the states to do the primary job that the money in this bill should be going for to get the violent criminals off the streets. But that amendment, that proposal was never accepted. And so if you only wind up with 20, 22 billion dollars in the end in the real money that's in this bill, uh, you're going to see, you know, that's what roughly a little or a third or so of, of, the, of the proposal. Uh, you're going to see maybe only $4 billion spent on prisons or something like that. Well, uh, I don't understand how we're going to handle this. I, I don't know whether we're going to go Commerce, uh, Justice, and State bill. Are we going to bring that back? Are we going to do a supplemental? Or how we're going to front end load this thing? Or why we're, you know, what the exact process is going to be to put this bill together into what we've already got. And I presume somebody in the leadership does. But uh, I am concerned that not only do we have this about $11 billion or up to $11 billion dollar uh, mystery gap uh, at this point. I'll characterize it as that. I think shortfall is a fair statement, but I'll call it a mystery gap. Um, I, on top of that, we've got $13 billion coming in on this program after the cap, budget caps expire in 99 and 2000, and that goes right into the deficit hole. So I could probably fairly say that we're almost $25 billion into the deficit, further into the deficit from this one bill the way it's being presented to us now. But I, I'm a little reluctant to say that because there's got to be a better answer than that. Well, the, the least you can say, Mr. Goss, is that this is a flawed bill, I believe. Uh, flawed for a number of reasons, and as we get into it, I think we'll find out more. That's not to say, again, uh, that it's all bad. No, no, I know there's the some beginning. good things in there's here. There's some good things in it we'd all like to pass. The problem is how do you balance the public interest here? Uh, are we really going to want to do all the things this bill is saying we're going to do and mess things up as badly as you and I think this may well happen if we pass this bill uh, in the name of getting the others accomplished we do agree with? And on the whole, I just don't think we want the bill the way it is. And that's why I hope we at least uh, get a motion uh, to recommit with instructions uh, approved by this committee. Last question. Are there any predictions about the reduction in crime rates if this bill passes in its present form? Well, there's no predictions on it. Obviously, the crime rate is not likely to go down uh, in terms of the spending part of this. Uh, on pre prevention, uh, we've had $5 trillion, Mr. Goss, has been spent to over since 1965 on the very same type of jobs type programs in the inner cities and on social welfare that this bill would add another 8 or $9 billion for. And yet we've had a 500 percent increase in the rate of violent crime in the nation since 1965. So I can't predict to you that the rate that violent crime is going to go down in this country. I would hope that marginally, with whatever little bit of money does go to the prisons for the states, that we would get some truth in sentencing and some progress in that area. But I don't know how you put a percentage on it, locking up these repeat violent felons and taking a few of them off. And that should help some. But I don't think this goes nearly as far in the direction that it should nor with the priorities that it should to get the job done the American public expects this bill based on the rhetoric to do. It's just not going to do it. And essentially, it's a bad bill overall, in my judgment. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Actually, uh, it's the intention of the chair to uh, allow a motion to inspect the conference on this. So the gentleman will be protected. Thank you. And I was just wondering if uh, you have an idea of what you're going to be putting in that motion. Are you going to put the salt weapons? Well, at the present time, we haven't made that decision. I think uh, Mr. Hall may have asked me that earlier. Mr. Frost, I guess, did. Um, I, we, we're looking now, Mr. Chairman, at the money, uh, trying to put something in here would boost the money for prisons up, take the money out of the prevention side. Uh, the decision on assault weapons has not been made. Uh, that is, of course, a great subject of controversy, and that's not yet been determined. So actually, you're trying to put the balance you've been talking about in 
I'd like to put the balance in this bill. I believe we've got way too much going into the one side of the ledger and not enough for the prisons. And you're talking about a big shortfall, six and a half billion when we really need 10 to 12. But as, a, as one who's worked uh, oddly on, on this matter and, and sat in on the uh, conference committee and uh, sat in every phase of this thing, Bill is flawed. I mean, anything that's huge is not a per you'd never get a perfect bill. Uh, no, you never would, Mr. Chairman, but this bill has, if you, you try to weigh things, that's the Judiciary Committee more than anybody else tries to do that. All of us in public policy, you and I, I'm sure do. And I've tried to look at the weight on this and say, well, where's the good in the bill? And there is some good over here, but where's the bad? And the bad is way up here somewhere. And mm -hmm. it's just, that's why I say it's flawed. It's, it's more than the average well, technical the, problems we don't agree with. If the bad is way up there, it's not flawed. The bad would have to be down here for it. Well, whichever flawed. way. It's too, it's out of skew. <laughs> However way you want to weight the balance. Mr. There's Chairman, too much would, weight on the side of it. Would you yield, bad. Mr. Chairman? I yield. Mr. Chairman, I just want to uh, point out that, um, you know, one of the flaws is, is the philosophy uh, behind this whole uh, issue. And, Bill, you brought it out so succinctly when you said that uh, there were going to be, for every single new cop on the beat that is provided for in this bill, which, incidentally, this is the rough draft that Mr. Brooks was referring to, it's just been laid uh, on our table here, okay? It, it is as big as he represented, isn't it? It, it is Every bigger than he represented. He, uh, he didn't exaggerate. Well, you uh, know those texts. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but what my point was, was, uh, you know, that uh, it does provide, and you brought it out, two social workers for every new cop on the beat. Two new social that, workers. That's what the Heritage them. Foundation report is supposedly right. is going to say they're and, out today. With. And the thing that really just gets people like me is the fact that, you know, we went through, and I was a part of it, uh, negotiating with, uh, with Congressman Steny Hoyer on, on trying to reduce the size of the federal workforce by 250,000 employees. And we were going to take those monies and we were going to apply it to, to this unconscionable sea of red ink that is just killing this country. Now, here we go again, and we've done it several times with, with the money that we're supposed to be saving by reducing the federal workforce. We are now creating another workforce, uh, a government workforce. So the American people aren't realizing any savings at all from reducing those 250,000 employees. We're hiring 250,000 more. And that's the flaw in, in this whole thing. We just, uh, and that's a shame. But I wanted to point out that we do have the rough draft here, Bill, and uh, uh, your staff uh, and mine and everybody else's uh, can be looking through this. We, again, I think Mr. Mokley is going to help us in delaying this from reaching the floor until Friday. So we do have at least three days to be able to look at, at the finished product, which we will get probably in about another hour. But I want you to also recognize that I am not the no. court of last resort of when this bill hits the floor. No, but you're a very powerful uh, chairman, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Thank you. Is that an endorsement? <laughs> <laughs> bill, you've been great. Uh, we you. uh, enjoyed your... Uh, did uh, Mr. Wheat, did you... He had a question. Mr. Frost, you've already... Thank you very much for your Th testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. The Honorable Donald Manzulu of Illinois. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Geekus. I sat there for two hours. I sorry. Our friendship almost melted. It's almost melted. <laughs> Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, <clears throat> what we've been listening to this morning is, to me, a description not of a crime bill, but of a prime time bill. It carries with it in its provisions so many attractive features that every member can go back to his district or her district and say when he or she votes for this bill, I voted for a crime bill, but it's nothing more than a, uh, an answer, a response to a reporter on how, uh, how he or she voted on a so-called crime bill, a prime time bill, not a crime bill. And that's what has worried most of us. All of the objections have already been set forth. What I want to do is to add one other feature, and which is predictable on my part, and which you will acknowledge is predictable, and that is on the death penalty provisions. It appears to me that the members of the Rules Committee, and indeed the members of the, of the uh, House, are unwitting uh, co-conspirators 
with those who oppose the death penalty in lumping the death penalty into this massive crime bill. There was some discussion, as I think the chairman pointed out, Mr. Moakley pointed out, is why is Mr. McCollum opposed to a bill when he knows there'd be flaws in it? It's too big a bill. It shouldn't be a, a big bill. That's the answer. We should be focusing on the law enforcement provisions and vote those up or down. Death penalty, three strikes you're out, and prisons. And then vote separately on midnight basketball. Se vote separately on new job creation preventive measures. I know that that's not the way we do things around here, but that's the answer to the chairman's question of how do we uh, eliminate the flaws on a big bill. But as the We're chairman, going to be spending money, Mr. Moakley, on referees for midnight basketball when they could be for law enforcement officers. Now, that's, that's ridiculous. But the gentleman well knows that any time you label a bill, whatever the label is, everybody wants to put everything that could fall under that umbrella in there. Well, we've got to stop it. But I think that they've weeded out many things, but uh, th they We've do... We've got to stop that, Joe. Well, We've I'm... got to stop lump lumping in a comprehensive bill. 6,000 items, was somebody said, well, I voted for the crime bill, but I know that it's going to cost too much, but I, I wanted three strikes and you're out, but so I'm going to take midnight basketball, and I want more prisons over here, but we'll, we'll give one and a half cops to every community uh, for a couple of years and let them take up the slack. That's ridiculous, and it's bad policy, and we've got to try to change it. Well, if, would, would the gentleman agree that uh, if the people uh, in the high-risk area of committing crime are, are, are giving these recreational choices, that they probably would take them rather than do the violence that is being done in the neighborhoods now? Mr. Chairman. We can take any one of the existing programs already on the books, already sucking up money in the local communities in a hundred different ways, and convert those or aim them more, with more focus, if the chairman wants, towards midnight basketball or towards other job training. We have so many overlapping programs now, money's flowing into the local communities with these other programs, that we can mold into them the midnight basketball, if that's going to be a panacea, or any other program. But don't throw more money, create a bigger bu bureaucracy, create more uh, discretionary spending, and take it out of what money is, is supposed to be savings to go towards deficit reduction, when there are already monies there that can be used for those purposes. But I'm not here specifically to talk about the money situation. I want to point out something about the death penalty that, that ought to be within the ken of the members of the Rules Committee when they approach this problem. A uh, point of parliamentary inquiry, though, uh, if, uh, if I may. Uh, not, but an inquiry, I yield to the chairman to answer this question. If the Rules Committee should see in its wisdom not to, not to offer the waivers, not to include waivers in its rule, is it the logical result, then, that the, those items that are beyond the scope or non-germane, as have been described here, would come up separately for votes? What would happen if the waivers were not supplied by the Rules Committee? Say, say, what say would the happen? question again. Yeah, right. Let's assume I, that the Rules Committee... All right, I'd like, I, well, I'll, I want to hear the question. Oh, okay. yeah, what would happen if the Rules Committee, in its wisdom, would decide not to indulge in the waivers that would cover the beyond the scope issues and the non-germane issues. What if the Rules Committee, in its wisdom, felt that that was not appropriate? What would be the result? Well, the result is that some of these waivers are, are so necessary that it would be a fatal blow to the whole conference committee. No, 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 I, I know that. What I'm saying is, what would be the posture of the Rules Committee? Would it go on the floor then with a bill that we would vote on these beyond the scope issues separately? Absolutely. No. The, the whole no. conference report falls because of if the, the rules scope. committee. Yeah, but he wants to know. Yeah, someone on the floor would raise a point That's of order. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. What I'm saying is that the rules committee uh, uh, has hands off on this, shall we say? It goes to the floor. But we don't have hands off. We have to report. No, it no. Up. But you decide <laughs> not to indulge in the waivers. Let's okay. say that uh, hypothetically. You say then it goes to the floor. Mm -hmm. Then we have to vote only on points of orders, not the substance of the, the measures that are beyond the scope. 
Mr. Con Mr. Brooks would bring up a conference report, and any any member could stand and make a point of order against uh, any uh, point. And uh, usually, uh, the uh, the waivers are so necessary that then the entire conference committee would fall. Mr. Chairman, might I be recognized? Gentlemen, on the, uh, yeah. Uh, the truth of the matter is that uh, Mr. Brooks is a, a very astute, uh, intelligent chairman, and he knows what is uh, what requires waivers in this bill. And uh, we normally insist that chairmen that come before this committee give us a list of specifics of the uh, waivers that are necessary uh, so that we can then point it out to the general membership. Uh, under the normal rules of the House, uh, conference reports do not come to this Rules Committee. They go directly right. to the that's, floor, that's what and if there me. are points of order to be made because of scope or, or germaneness, uh, then points of order are raised against them. Uh, in this particular case, if we didn't have this rule, that's what would happen. They would simply go back to the conference and they would iron out those differences. Uh, or they would come to the Rules Committee, as they're doing now, and ask for a point, uh, points of order. We don't have any specifics. Mr. Brooks says, in, um, in essence, he said, do you think I'm crazy? I'm not going to give you a list of Mr. Goss's question over there. I'm not going to give you a list of those because people would just be out there uh, raising points of order against them. But normal rules of the House, any member would have that opportunity. Then I, I, but having I understand said that, fully that many conference committees do come up here because when, when, when they're, they're conferencing that there's always something added or something dropped and therefore to make the, 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 the conference committee whole and acceptable to both branches, we then waive the rules and let it go to the floor for an up or down vote on the conference committee. That's correct. So that my objections and all the others would have to be raised in the battle on the rule on the floor, which I understand perfectly. In other words, if something is uh, unworthy of my vote as it's now constituted, I have to m vote against the Gentlemen's rule. Gentlemen's correct. I understand. All right. Now let's get to the... You to can vote against the conference report also. There's one other question that I have to raise with the chairman. Of what worth, pray tell, somebody's got to answer this for me, is a motion to instruct on the floor of the House when it resounds in a, in a confirmation of something that happened previously on the floor of the House when the main bill was up for discussion, of what worth is that when the House conferees can ignore it totally and even present views opposite to that as their offers to, to the Senate side of the conferees? It's a rhetorical question, but I, I have to find out sometime during my career whether it's worth while bringing a motion to instruct on the floor uh, on any subject. Let me give you an idea. The House reported a death penalty provision that allowed the jury such wide discretion in determining whether life or death should apply in a particular case that it reverted to a situation prior to 1972 when discretion was so rampant on the part of the juries that the Supreme Court struck down the death penalty saying the way it is now, then, the jury could find life imprisonment and reject death simply because of the smile of the criminal or vote death penalty because of the, of the scowl on the part of the, of the criminal who committed murder. So to knock out that discretion, they found this death penalty to be unconstitutional. What happened then? I need the full attention of the uh, No, I'm chairman. just getting some... Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's just me. I don't like to interfere in that conversation. While he is uh, receiving some, uh, some information, let me tell you that uh, the only advantage uh, is that uh, when you do have a motion to instruct the yeah. conferees, uh, it is purely ro uh, rhetorical. It doesn't really have any, any meaning except that you do have members that serve on as conferees and once you catch them on a vote on the floor voting to sustain my to, motion. to keep your motion on the death penalty in the bill then when that conferee has to go up there and you being a conferee as well you can force a vote on it upstairs in the conference then you catch him in a, in a hypocritical situation oh, and that, that can hurt him politically. That is the only advantage because yes, it's it only is not binding. It's only a record of using the record. Yeah. So let's, go, let's go back to where we were. But the, uh, the, uh, 
main gist of the gentleman's question is probably best answered by saying that the House members cannot bind the Senate. Oh, I so it's just advisory as far as the... That I knew. Right. That I knew. But I thought at least the House conferees should stick to the guns that were offered to them and confirmed more than one time by the motion to instruct. But that's another problem mm. that I have to face when I'm in the majority, okay. which may be... I don't know when. Anyway, uh, let's get back to the work. Yeah, right. Let's get back to uh, what I said. Now, the bill that the House Judiciary Committee presented to the floor uh, over my objections and over my amendments, defeating my amendments in full judiciary on the death penalty, was flawed in my, my opinion. So I offered an amendment on the floor, which was carried. Namely, that in the instructions that the judge gives to the jury on the death penalty, on the second portion of a death penalty case, has to be to the jury that if they find that the, the number of aggravating factors outweigh the mitigating factors, or vice versa, then they shall find, either for the death penalty if the aggravating are prevail, or the life imprisonment if the, if the mitigating prevail. And it won on the floor thereby rejecting the bill's notion of that full discretion that I thought was anathema to the bill. So now I felt good. We had a bill that, at least with the death penalty instructions, it was constitutionally sound. Several other states have already been found to be constitutional on the basis of the language that I used, including, I wanted to see if Massachusetts was there. No, it isn't. But uh, Arizona, California, Connecticut, Ohio, uh, Illinois, Maryland, Pennsylvania, Oregon, Texas, Washington, etc. So we would have had a wonderful counterpart on the federal death penalty jurisdiction on a measure that was found to be constitutional by the Supreme Court on the state level, and we would be in tandem if my position would prevail. Now follow what happened. Now we have a bill with the Geekus Amendment in it. The conference committee is dawdling. The conference committee, is, conference committee is dawdling, and I'm drinking. I'm dawdling also. And at any rate, the conf. <laughs> so, at a, in a, an appropriate time, I enter a motion to instruct conferees, and by an overwhelming vote, the House reconfirmed the Geekus Amendment on the. Now, what happens in the conference? This is what galls me. In the conference, not only did the House conferees not adhere to, I'm talking about the House conferees, not adhere to the motion to instruct or to the language of the amendment that prevailed on the floor of the House, but not only did they, if they could have remained silent, it would have been better, but they offered as a part of the final conference bill the Senate language. I'm talking about the House conferees rejected the Geekus Amendment, rejected the motion to instruct, rejected the will of the House, and offered, on their part, the Senate version of the death penalty instructions uh, for consideration by the conference. I don't know how else I can express frustration and, uh, and incredulity on the part of our way of doing things than to, to outline that to the uh, Rules Committee. What I'm asking for, then, is and I'm hoping to prevail on the House Republican leadership that in the motion to instruct, or the motion to recommit with instructions to the conferees, that we include the Geekus Amendment as confirmed by the motion to instruct, as already confirmed by the Supreme Court of the United States as the proper way to reflect upon the imposition of the death penalty. I thank the Chair. Any questions? George, let me just say that um, you are certainly one of the most valued members of the Judiciary Committee, and we really appreciate your input. Um, we uh, evidently are going to be able to have the right for a motion to recommit, provided the Senate does not act first. Uh, and I will help you with the Republican leadership to make sure that that is included in the motion to recommit. Thank you so much for coming. I thank you. Any other thank you. Thank you very much. The Honorable Donald Manzullo. Mr. Manzullo. Thank you, Mr. Mokridge, Chairman. 
I learned in law school that procedure is the heart of the law. And I guess as part of the election of 1992, I believe I was elected here to help reform Congress and change the way things are done around here, especially in the Rules Committee. Uh, and I'm extremely frustrated because I'm one of those members of Congress that whenever an important piece of legislation comes, I'll take the entire bill and read it. And that accounts for uh, many times I'm in the office with two and three and four hours sleep, but I insist that every page contains material that's extremely important to the people in this country, and especially to those that I represent in the 16th District of Illinois. I'm particularly frustrated over the fact that I've heard rumors, and perhaps they've been disqualified today, that 912A may be waived and that we won't have the three-day waiting period. My understanding, uh, Mr. Chairman, is that you're going to uh, put up a tremendous battle to make sure that the members of Congress have the opportunity at least to read the legislation before it's voted upon. Um, I see up there two folders. And Jerry, uh, how many pages are in there? Do you have any idea? Well, about 900. Uh, More than 1,000, I think, between the two. Uh, somewhere between 900 and 1,000 pages. And in the House, it was 280 pages. And it grew uh, to that extent. And this also includes the state statement of the managers. OK. Uh, what is particularly distressing is the fact that even if 912A is found and the bill is reported today, that means that probably the earliest time when we'll get a copy of the bill as printed in the re congressional record would be Thursday morning. Oh, no. Is that correct? This is Tuesday. Be, be, he, either late this afternoon or tomorrow morning. So we could have a copy of it by tomorrow morning. Absolutely. And uh, if the vote is done on Friday, then we would have at least somewhere around 48 hours within which to, um, to read it. I am here to request that the members here do everything possible to make sure that 912A is not waived. The rules at the minimum, and this is unbelievable, but it is the rules state that at the minimum, unless the rule is waived, we'll have two hours um, <laughs> during which period of time we're supposed to read, digest, confer with our uh, people back home, come to a rational decision as to what's in it. I had uh, submitted before this full rules committee a bill, a very simple bill, uh, that expanded the definition of law enforcement officers and firemen to those who were killed in the line of duty to include police and fire chaplains. Uh, the, the Rules Committee issued uh, a rule that allowed that amendment uh, to be included in the, in the particular bill. And then I've been told that that provision which protects these chaplains that are putting their lives on the line in hostage situations uh, that protects those chaplains uh, that had been eliminated in conference and instead of uh, taking care of the families of these deceased chaplains who are obviously involved in tough law enforcement money is going to be spent for arts and crafts um, and i am just so disappointed that the hard work and the efforts of, of uh, the international associations with whom we have been working to at least uh, protect chaplains in the line of duty has been removed but I'm more distressed over the fact that uh, even if we get a copy of this bill, as the rules provide, it leaves only one or two days for reading and digesting, that we will not have the opportunity to read it. So I would therefore uh, implore the members here uh, to, at the minimum, not waive 912A uh, so that we can have a copy of the bill when we vote upon it. Thank you, uh, Mr. Nielsen. Mr. Solomon. Congressman Manzullo, uh, we really do appreciate your coming here, and you're absolutely right. Uh, even if we had 48 hours, uh, you and staff could not uh, really understand what's in the bill. 
including your, your section uh, that you were concerned about. I had a very important amendment which was adopted overwhelmingly in the House, uh, which said that um, in the three strikes and you're out, that um, any one of those uh, convictions could be a serious drug felony, serious drug felony. I'm not sure what happened to my amendment in that, uh, in that bill. I haven't been able to find it since this was delivered a few minutes ago. But what we are doing, the Republican leadership, uh, at a request I made earlier this morning, uh, is asking the Democrat leadership to lay this bill over, not just for three days, but uh, over the weekend. Uh, we do not have a terrible rush of business for next week. And there is no reason why we couldn't take this up on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday of next week, which would at least give staff time to evaluate the bill and to give us their judgment. Uh, they cannot do it in 48 hours. But thank you. I really do appreciate well, your coming. I, I recall when, when the earthquake relief bill came up, I was waiting on the floor with my staff out back, and, and, and the vote was coming up. So I waited there, and finally somebody delivered this humongous conference report, and I ran out of the chambers with it. I, I may have had the only copy in existence. And I went into the back there, and my staff was pouring over this thing, and there we found the $5 million that had been set aside to remodel Penn Station. Unless Penn Station has been in the San Andreas Fault, the money shouldn't have been appropriated. But it's this, this hurry up, shove things down our throat, this type of attitude and the rush, 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 that leads to bad legislation. And, and that's why I came here this morning in frustration, and I thank you for your time. Well, thank you for being such a conscientious member. Just, just Don, I very much appreciate you bringing this matter up. You're trying to reinforce and doing it very well, a point that we make here regularly. Um, these things about uh, the ebb and flow of uh, legislation, the opportunity members have to see things and not see things, uh, just don't happen by chance or by circumstance. Uh, some uh, happen because of crush of time. Some are, are manipulated. Uh, it's hard to know which. We try and do our best to make sure we stick to the rules unless there's a good reason to waive them. And of course, we're seriously outweighed here. But you've had, you've, you've suggested one very good point. It's the same point that George Geek has made to us. Maybe the media ought to start asking members of Congress not whether you voted for or against the crime bill, but whether you read the crime bill. It would be an interesting to see how they'd answer that question. Thank you very much, Thank Mr. You. Chairman. Thank you very, very much for your excellent testimony. The, um, the committee will stand uh, in recess for just a moment and uh, pending the return of the chairman.
It's been decided uh, as a result of the stellar testimony we've had before us to uh, delay voting on the rule until tomorrow afternoon in order that people can get the papers that they want to see in the... It's a copy of the Oh, it's only just a copy now that I'm doing this, but it would be voluminous things if I didn't do it. All right. So we'll meet uh, three o'clock about three o'clock tomorrow afternoon. Well, Mr. Chairman, we we really appreciate uh, your delaying it, um, and we appreciate the, the uh, cooperation of the speaker uh, because it will get give members a chance to look at the finish. This is a rough draft, yes, uh, uh, and uh, this way it will benefit all of the members, and we, we appreciate your being cooperative. Thank of course, you. Uh, our problem is because we've only got a couple of weeks left. We've got the health care bill. We've got uh, you know congressional reform and so many other things that we just have to rush through as quick as we can. So that's why we try to do it today, but it it was shown to be a very So when will big we meet? Go. We will meet again tomorrow at we'll 3 We'll meet about 3 o'clock tomorrow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Well, but we will save those Indian bills, won't we? Those, are, those Indian bills are going forward on schedule, aren't they, Mr. Chairman? I hope so. Very important. <laughs> I, that's, so I'm reassured. Thank you. Committee on Rules will stand adjourned. Yeah.
The $33.2 billion crime bill includes funds for 100,000 new police, prison construction, and crime prevention programs. The bill also includes provisions that would send some three-time federal felons to prison for life. For viewers following the legislative activity of the 103rd Congress, C-SPAN is offering its 1994 Congressional Directory.